Good evening, everybody. It's Terry Holloway speaking. I'm the managing director of the Cambridge Area Club, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you all to this, the, the latest um, winter lecture. We hold lectures every winter with a particular focus on safety and looking at air traffic control and airspace management. Um, infringements are a big thing for the CAA at the moment, and this is a really topical safety topic. So it's great to see you all here, and it's a particular pleasure to introduce to you Flight Sergeant Neil MacDonald. Neil is a controller and supervisor at RAF Bryce Norton, doing his second tour there. He's previously served at Cottesmore, RAF Cottesmore, just up the road from us at Cambridge, so he knows East Anglia extremely well. And I see from his past record, he's had a real hardship tour at RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus. Lucky man, one of my most favourite places in the Royal Air Force. Neil, as you will discover when he talks, is a very enthusiastic supporter of general aviation, and he firmly believes, as we all do, in the importance of engagement as an important flight safety topic. What he's going to do this evening is talk to us about the use of, of Bryce Norton's Class D airspace. We all, all of us, I'm sure, fly close to, through or around Bryce Norton's airspace, so he's going to be talking about that Class D airspace, as well as the challenges of large aircraft operating in the Class G airspace, which surrounds Bryce Norton. So that's a brief introduction and a very warm welcome to you, Neil. And without any further ado, you have control, Neil. Over to you. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, uh, Terry, um, Kat and Mike as well, and everyone at um, Cambridge Aero Club for this invite. Um, as Terry said, we believe strongly uh, in this surprise, you know, the um, engagement with the GA community. Um, it, it helps to keep everybody safe. Um, I've done a number of these in person um, and this is a different way of doing it. It's a good way of doing it. I would prefer to be there in person with you guys and then we could have a beer after. But, you know, this is a really good um, alternate um, beer. Yeah, um, I will. It's been put on the chat, but I will happily take any questions at any time because I prefer people to while they think of a question to get that question out rather than wait until the end. Um, so I'm happy to take questions. Um, inter interrupt, please do. Um, if you see any slides um, that particularly interest you or if you enjoy the presentation and want a copy of it, I'm happy to send a copy to you. It's all um, open source stuff. There's nothing on there that is not, um, that is official sensitive or anything. Um, yeah, so um, I'll get on with the presentation uh, with the next slide. Yeah, that's just me, uh, I'm an air traffic control officer. As he said, um, I'm fully qualified at Bryce um, and a supervisor. Um, so I'll be the guy who's who's um, giving you approval for if you ring up uh, and want a PD. Uh, I'll be the guy um, between Monday and Friday. I'll be the guy saying, yeah, that's no problem at all. And we do welcome that at Bryce. Uh, it helps our training. Uh, obviously, it would help your training as well. But it helps our training to have approaches um, subject to our traffic. But yeah, we do welcome um, we do welcome uh, approaches. Um, our specialists will take your, your insurance details, etc., just to make that approach totally legal. But um, and if you wanted a PAR or an SRA, you have to ask for that. We can't offer it to you, um, but we offer that. We offer our, obviously our ILS, TACAN approaches, uh, NDB DMEs. Um, so yeah, please feel free. Uh, next slide, please, Bing. Uh, so the scope of this uh, presentation, can you whack it through to the end, Mike, to the bottom of this page? Um, yeah, that'll do. Oh, back one, please. Yeah, so the scope of this is um, to I'm going to talk about the Bryce Norton Control Zone, uh, which is Class D airspace. I'm going to talk about the Bryce VRPs, um, which uh, we encourage um, you to use if you're using, if you want to use our Class D airspace. It gives us a chance to identify you. It gives us a chance to know where you are. Uh, it's a useful reporting point for you guys as well. Um, I'm going to talk about why the controlled airspace is there, um, types of service available outside and inside controlled airspace, uh, management of the Class D airspace, uh, the conflictions that you may encounter, and the separation standards that we adhere to um, as controllers. Uh, next one, please, mate. Uh, so, yeah, and then... Um, Standard crossing routes, um, obtaining your crossing clearances. So a bit of the phraseology, which will probably just, um, unless anybody really wants to go through that, um, we'll probably sort of skirt through. Uh, zone crossing phraseology, 
um, some distractions, which could be your distractions or our distractions, uh, some top tips, and there'll be a conclusion at the end. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so the Bryce Norton controlled airspace uh, it's ground level to 3,500 feet Bryce Q&H and it's H24, 365 days a year. Christmas Day I was working um, and I was there. Um, I was there for national standby. I was there for Tanzor and I was there for in charge of the zone. Uh, we had zero zone crosses that day, but I was there just in case anybody called us because it is H24, 365 days. Um, it's class D airspace is a known traffic environment. So before entering that controlled airspace, uh, we would need to identify you. Uh, that's so that we can coordinate you against our traffic if we have any traffic. Um, and um, aircraft must not enter without clearance from Bryce ATC. And if you do so, um, it's a mandatory report that we have to report that. So we will try and find out. Um, we'll try and find out who who did it, um, and we will try and and we will file on them, which then goes to the CAA and then uh, follow on actions. Um, we've um, Oxford have got Mode Sierra uh, radar, so they can interrogate pretty much any aircraft to find out uh, who they are. Um, and yeah, so that's quite important um, because we're trying to make it safer by. You know, people might not be even be aware. Um, I was speak to Terry earlier and um, Mike, and I was saying about there was a, a glider. Um, we've got a in July a glider penetrated Bryce controlled airspace. Um, he didn't even realise he was in Bryce controlled airspace, and he came head to head with one of our A330s. Um, he wasn't. He, he didn't even know. He basically had just flown off route a little bit. Didn't know where he was, and was in class D airspace. So, yeah, it does happen. Um, but we do need to educate people and we need to, edu edu you know, educate and we need to stop that happening because obviously that creates a bit of a, sen a dangerous scenario. Next one, please, Mike. And a bit more. There you go. And that's the situation. That's Bryce uh, on an OS map. Um, so, yeah, with the Bryce visual reporting points, uh, we've got. Uh, it's probably Charlbury if you come if you guys are coming from Cambridge type area Charlbury is probably the one most relevant to yourselves um, but also depending on where you are rooting from there's North Leach Roundabout Burford uh, Letchlade um, Farrington to the south then you've got Bampton and Farmer Reservoir which are inside Class D airspace uh, but they're very visual from from the air and with them basically is we might give you a routing via these places so even though they're in controlled airspace we may say to you route Charlbury Farmer Reservoir or Route Charbury to Bampton, and we might give you an altitude, and that's just to deconflict against our traffic. Uh, next one, please. So, why is it there? So, it's to protect the large unmovable aircraft uh, during the critical stages of recovery and departure. So, that's our C-17s, A-400s, Charlie 130s, and A-330 military aircraft. Um, less so now, but we were um, during. Afghanistan and, and Iraq, uh, we were getting large civilian airliners in. So because our military aircraft were being utilized in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Cyprus jobs and the Falkland jobs were, were civilian airliners. Um, and, you know, there, there was 290, sometimes 293 people, people on board these aircraft. Um, yeah. So obviously we need to we need to protect them. And we just simply haven't got the amount of airspace that your Heathrow's have or your uh, Luton's have. Um, so the, the airspace is quite um, restricted. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so yeah, we also protect um, Fairford mats um, when Fairford's uh, open, and that's significantly uh, more active lately um, as the uh, um, as the issues with Russia um, continue. Um, the Americans have put a lot of uh, hardware into Fairford, which they. Um, utilized to fly basically they go on their big long missions and we look after fairford as well um so the types of service available um outside of controlled airspace is basic service traffic service or deconfliction service and then within controlled airspace uh, you'll get a radar control um yeah next one uh so the with the radar control um the controller is responsible for the separation between I ifi aircraft and for terrain clearance and so when you're IFR, if you're looking to transit Bryce Control Airspace IFR, we're responsible for you. We're responsible for you from other aircraft and from terrain. So um, the radar vector chart at Bryce is 1,800 feet. So if you're on an IFR um, crossing 
um, you we will not let you fly below 1,800 feet, and that's purely for terrain clearance. Uh, next one, please, mate. Next bit. Uh, so yeah, so uh, VFR um, aircraft will operate in accordance with the ATC clearance issued. Uh, keep going, please, Mike. So with VFR, uh, pilots responsible for separation from other aircraft. Um, we do things a bit differently at Bryce in that, and the pilots responsible for terrain clearance. Um, when you're VFR uh, crossing, um, we building uh, we build in a separation of 500 feet and three miles prior to um, the clearance. So we basically try and keep you um, 500 feet and three miles away from our aircraft until you're visual with that aircraft. And what we do is we then call that aircraft out to you, hoping that you get visual. Once you're visual, it becomes a lot easier and we just tell you to, to basically route behind. Other, other um, control zones, control, um, control zones, they will just call the traffic to you and basically say, if you're VFR, they will um, just tell you to avoid that aircraft and tell you where the aircraft is. But we will a little bit um, more we want to be a bit more proactive and we want to keep you out of the way basically um, of the aircraft. Um, so yeah, we just build that 500 feet in. Next one, please, Mike. Um, so the approach controller is the airspace manager. Um, however, the controller you're talking to may not be. So if there's a delay, um, there could be a delay. So which is why we ask um, for you to call uh, 10 miles or five minutes flying time before, um, because it gives us time to sort the situation out. Um, so the zone controller, is the guy you're talking to. The approach controller is the, the airspace manager. So the zone controller has to speak to the approach controller to get your crossing. Uh, sometimes the job is being done by the approach controller and he's doing both and it's a bit quicker, but you know, when we're busy, the zone controller is is getting you that clearance. Um, so that's why sometimes there's a bit of a delay. It doesn't happen straight away. It's because he's trying to get permission and it, you know, he's working that against departures, against the inbounds, etc. But the approval to cross will be given to you by the zone controller. Keep going, Meg, please. Yeah, there we go. Uh, possible conflictions. So a Bryce, the RTC um, is 2,800 feet, uh, descending to 2,300 feet. Short pattern circuits at um, 1,800 feet um, inbounds. Then we have CAT A approaches, which is our uh, heli any helicopter we get or any slower moving aircraft, they'll also be descending to 1,800 feet at eight miles. Um, the visual circuit at Bryce is 1,800 feet um, normal altitude with a low level circuit at 1,300 feet, which is for our flying club. Uh, our Herx can do 1,300 feet circuits. Our A400s can do 1,300 feet circuits as well. That's no normally due to weather. Um, and then our aircraft inbound um, from airways, the predominant airway we use is Quebec 63. And their flight level eight zero descending, and frequently deconfliction service, um, especially um, especially if we've got any civilians inbound, they will be deconfliction service. And then aircraft outbound also going to Quebec six three, they'll be climbing to flight level eight zero. Next one, please, mate. Yeah, civil airliners will always be deconfliction service. They um, it's just it's in their it's in their terms of engagement. Really, it's in their terms of um, for using us uh, for their insurance. Um, so as soon as we get them out of controlled airspace and into Bryce, uh, and this is the next slide shows that. So uh, Quebec 63 is where Siren is and Marby is, that's Quebec 63. Um, that's our inbound. So that's our standard approach. Um, London released the aircraft to us at Siren. And then uh, the base of that airway is flight level 65. So while it's in controlled airspace is protected, However, the minute it leaves controlled airspace, and if it's on a deconfliction service, that becomes an issue for us. Um, so we take the aircraft up to Molby and then across to Naxat, that's standard. And then the reverse of that is outbound Naxat, Molby, Siren. However, we can take them off uh, the airways a bit earlier and we can give them an early turn if it's if it's beneficial to do so, um, to, get, to be more expeditious. Uh, next one, please, mate. So the uh, separation standards, so civil aircraft. Um, yep, yeah, next one. So for civilian aircraft who are IFR, we'll go for a thousand feet and three miles. Um, and then, yeah, so 1,000 feet and three miles. Next one, please. On a bit. So IFR versus IFR, it's three miles or 1,000 feet. We will uh, offer reduced vertical separation to 500 feet. If it helps, um, but it has to be agreed. So if we are, we have to say to the 
pilot and the pilot has to agree we can't just impose it um but sometimes if we're stacking aircraft in in the hold it might be that if you can't you know it's either agree to 500 feet separation um or it might be a massive reroute so I, i'm pretty sure like most, most of the pilots here would say i prefer um to get that 500 feet um vfr versus ifr so the initially we do the three miles 500 feet um but then as soon as the pilot is visual with the ifr aircraft uh, the pilot the vfr pilot can take on separation um, which is very helpful because it just means that we can get you on your way as quick as possible ideal scenario for us is if we've got nothing in the zone um nothing to conflict we just get you across that zone and we get you going uh, when it's vfr versus vfr uh, the pilot is responsible for own separation based on traffic information so we will tell you about other aircraft in controlled airspace and we will let you know that there's an aircraft there what height what altitude he's at where he is in relation to you um, and that's just um yeah if vfr versus vfr you're totally responsible for your own um separation against other aircraft but obviously we're just not going to let two aircraft fly into each other at the same altitude we're going to tell you about each other um and that's that's more of a duty of care thing and obviously i don't want that on my um conscience or um so yeah next one please mike so outside of controlled airspace so if um if you've got an aircraft a little bit more mate keep going there we go um so if you're inside controlled airspace versus versus an aircraft outside of controlled space so 3701 is something working me on zone. He's in my controlled airspace. He's routing westbound. 7000 is outside control airspace. In that circumstance, I will give you traffic information, but there's no need to avoid that aircraft, even if you're IFR, IFR because it's outside of control airspace. So you've got the inside outside rules. Um, but however, you would get traffic information there. Uh, next one, Mike. So it's relevant IFR only, but deemed separated from all traffic outside, we'll call. We'll call you about that because. You know, you never know what's coming. There might be a cloud in your way. You might want to turn left to avoid weather. So basically, if I give you that traffic information, you know there's an aircraft there. It's a bit, um, it's a bit safer. Uh, next one, please, Mike. Uh, a bit more. Uh, with special VFR. So the special VFR rules, obviously, um, keep going. And a bit more. So VFR is only at night. That's available. It is available during the day now. Um, and you may cross the CTR at night and in a day in certain circumstances, special VFR. Um, so the pilots flying under visual mech conditions, IFR separation uh, rules are applied. Um, the, pirates, it, the pilot is responsible for train separation. So with, with special VFR, so if our zone is classified as IFR, because in the Bryce ATZ, the weather is, is pretty bad, um, we can't give you a VFR crossing through the ATZ, so a pilot can request special VFR, which means that we can get you across the zone through the ATZ, special VFR. It's not something we can offer, but it's something that could be requested. And um, you can do a VFR crossing outside of the ATZ. It's just literally within the ATZ if we can't get you across uh, VFR because um, from the Met at Bryce is done at Bryce. Um, and in the local area. So it's sometimes localized fog at Bryce, whereas the rest of the zone is quite clear. But however, if you still want to cross directly and you still want to go across the um, the Bryce, say via Bampton, that is through the ATZ. So it would be um, special VFR only as opposed to VFR. Next one, please, mate. So we stand across in routes. So sometimes if um, we've got deemed routes, um, so if we want um if we've got stuff happening and uh the, the zone is quite busy with our aircraft um we would keep try and keep you eight miles east or eight miles west we'd ask you to squawk 3706 and that's either via farm or reservoir or it could be fairfield to north leach and it's basically keeping you eight miles west eight miles east uh not above 1800 feet and that wouldn't put you in confliction with any of our aircraft it's a vfr crossing um however it means that you get to cross our airspace with no issues you're below anything that might affect you we can keep everything out of your way um, um undeemed routes so 3300 feet any direction um works because that's 500 feet above uh the rtc um so you've got 2800 feet in the rtc so you'd be 500 feet above quite clearly if you're ifr that wouldn't work because we've got stuff for 2800 feet but then in that circumstance we could get our aircraft in the rtc to descend to 2300 feet early to get you across over the top um one mile in the approach lane at 2300 feet q and h works uh, that's a good uh, a, 
a good angle because an aircraft descending into Bryce um, would be well below that. Um, so we would specify at 2,300 feet uh, would keep you one mile on the approach lane. So basically that keeps you safe against our traffic. Um, and then there's, we can send you through the overhead. If you're low level, you can't climb because of cloud. Um, it'd be for 1,300 feet, not above 1,300 feet Q and H. Um, and if, as long as your VFR, that works, we'll probably send you to the tower controller, um, but we'd get you across. That would work against any circuit traffic because you'd be below it. You'd be on the same frequency as the circuit traffic. Or if the flying club were flying or there was one of the um, low level circuits going on, it would just be a case of VFR versus VFR. So we would you know, work that to try and keep you out of the way or we would keep you out of the way then. And you would, you should be visual and would be visual. Um, so these are the routes to expect when we have traffic to affect. Obviously the best case scenario for us and for you is we got nothing to affect. And that's when I, I use my favorite phraseology, which is clear to cross price, controlled airspace, VFR, no altitude or route restrictions. And that's just giving you exactly what you want. And that's, that's beneficial for me and it's beneficial for you. Next one, please, Mike. So yeah, so yeah, next one, please. So that's the, um, and one more, Mike. Of course, that's 3,300 feet. That's um, showing that runway 25 is in use, but 3,300 feet over the top. Uh, one more mic as well. There's a couple of, yeah, there we go. And one more. I think one more. So yeah, 3,000 feet, any direction. Again, we're getting a, a permission from approach. There could be that delay. Um, but if there's stuff happening, if there's stuff in the radar pattern and you can get to 3,300 feet, um, it, it basically all goes on what altitude you're calling us at. Because we're not going to, if you're at 2,000 feet, we're not going to try and get you to climb to 3,300 feet just for the sake of it. We're going to try and work around what's best for you. Making you climb 1,300 feet to get to 3,300 feet is quite clearly not the best option. You know, that could put you in cloud. That could that could change your whole dynamic of your flight. So we'd prefer not to do that. Uh, next one, please, Mike. So yeah, this just shows one mile in the approach lane. So can you fly through that, mate? Next one, please. And a bit more. There we go. So yeah, so with that one, um, if you fly within five miles of the um, of the visual circuit basis, you fly within five miles, five miles of the runway. We're also getting permission from the tower controller, and the tower controller may ask to work you. So it may be that you change the frequency. It's not ideal to change your, to change your frequency um, while you're flying in class D airspace. We understand that, but we think it's positives of being on the same frequency as anything in the circuit is probably outweighs the negatives of having to change frequency. Um, but yeah, it's not ideal to have to change from Bryce zone to Bryce tower, uh, you know, while you're flying in, in class D, it's, it's not perfect, but um, we'd probably give you a bit of a heads up that that's going to happen and give you the frequency. So it's all ready to go. Uh, next one, please, Mike. Yeah, and we'll be very clear with that east or west. Um, I have heard the phraseology in the past where they said um, um, a pilot was told to fly one mile on the approach lane by a controller, which was um, obviously ridiculous because without telling them what runway we are, it's, it, it's just stupid phraseology. But um, we'd be very clear. Um, we would ordinarily be very clear. One mile east, one mile west. And next one, Mike, please. So yeah, through the overhead. Um, yeah, fly that on, on for a bit, Mike, please. And a bit more. So yeah. So we asked Tower. So Tower might want to work that. So Tower could work anything that's with, with sort of within a visual circuit. If it's above the visual circuit traffic, probably not. But if it's at that altitude, uh, they would they would want to work it. And then they would. And when you got on frequency, they would call the, um, the Tower, the visual circuit traffic to you, and exactly where they were. And then you know it's a C and B scene type scenario. But um, VFR versus VFR. Uh, next one, please, mate. So there's factors we consider before a 10-year clearance. So are you flying IFR, VFR? Um, so if you're deconfliction service outside control airspace, we assume you're flying IFR. And if you're basic service, we assume you're flying VFR. But if you're under, if you ask for a traffic service, you'll be asked if you're flying VFR or IFR. Uh, we will get you on the Bryce Q&H. And that's just so everything is on the same pressure. Um, yeah, if the radar training circuit is active, if we might get you to alter altitude or route. Um, would deem crossing be more appropriate? Like I said earlier, we're not going to get you, if you're 1,800 feet, we're not going to get you climbing to 3,300 feet to get you over the top. We're going to try and route you um, maybe a little bit um, laterally out of the way, 
um, but certainly less of a pain for you than climbing 1500 feet into possible cloud and stuff um and then as a controller and as a zone controller who's talking to the approach controller i want to be presenting them with a solution rather than a problem so i may try and give you some instructions to help that out by asking if you could so i'll ask you questions like are you able to fly at 2300 feet because you know i know my cloud base it might be that 2300 feet is wholly inappropriate for you if you're flying at 1400 feet and you that's when you say to me no I, i'm you know that'll put me in cloud if that's gonna put you in cloud then that turns you from being vfr into not vfr so we you know we obviously don't want that because again it's presenting a solution it's presenting a problem to you and to my approach controller as opposed to presenting a solution so we're just trying to work a solution to try and get you across as as uh, quick and easy as possible next one please mike So there's some of the phraseology. Um, unless anyone is particularly thinking about the fra um, phraseology, I can go through it or I can um, whiz, I'll whiz through it quite quickly. So it's basically just, we're just giving the clearance of cleared VFR transit, price control airspace. Um, that's the bit that we need. And we just need a read back of that as well. Um, and then when you're entering the control zone, um, we'll tell you you're entering price control airspace and that you're radar control. And we will ask you to remain Victor Mike Charlie. It sounds weird to say that to you remain Victor Mike Charlie because We've already said VFR to you, um, but yeah, it's just um, it's just in the cap that that we need to reiterate it as you're entering Bryce Control airspace. So it's just you know because we if you're VFR crossing, we want you to remain Victor Mike Charlie. So we want you to be we want to just reiterate we want you to stay visual with the ground, etc. Because you know you're taking your own uh, separation there. Uh, next one, please, mate. So yeah, when we're going to send you to tower, we'll just say you're cleared to enter Bryce Control airspace, and we'll give you altitude. Um, and then we'll say expect a crossing clearance from Bryce Tower. I would chuck the frequency in there as well, just if you know, so you can write it down, so you're ready to go. Or if you've got another box, you can have it ready to go. And then if, when you're entering control, control airspace, entering Bryce control airspace, radar control, and again remain Victor Mike Charlie, and then report the air, airfield in sight. When you tell me you, you, the airfield's in sight, that's when I send you to tower. And then hopefully, then when you've got the airfield in sight, you'll have any circuit traffic in sight. Uh, next one, please, Mike. So with the IFR transit, it's pretty much the same. Um, and uh, the, um, yeah, you just, we specify IFR um, and then we're telling you at, it's more altitudes. We'll also say if if the IFR crossing is close to 1800 feet, we'll reiterate not below 1800 feet. Um, and then entering Bryce Control Space Radar Control. Quite clearly, we're not saying Victor Mike Charlie. Um, yeah, next one, please, mate. That can go straight on with that, actually. I thought I'd hit on that one. I've got a hit on mine, actually. Um, so, yeah, keep going. Redlands is, quite, is gone, unfortunately. Uh, so this is a weekend radar capture. So that was taken on a weekend in June. Um, so all the red is uh, various um, sites that are active. Um, so the Little Riz to the north, uh, Abingdon to the southeast, uh, South Cerny to the, to the west, um, which is shortly... I think they're getting hang gliding there soon. Um, Hinton and Hedges, northeast. Um, Chargrove to the southeast under Benson. So there's lots of paratropping sites on weekends. And then the orange um, blobs, uh, for, to coin a, a better word, um, is, is probably gliders, is probably, or aircraft that are flying without a transponder. Um, obviously, aircraft flying without a transponder are a problem because rather than taking 3,000 feet against them, we have to take the five miles um, and we can't take vertical separation. We just have to fly around them, basically. Um, so if I'm bringing something off Quebec 6.3 and bringing it, um, if I'm bringing something from Quebec 6.3 from Siren and Malby as earlier, and I'm bringing that into Bryce Controlled Airspace, um, all those orange blobs around Kemble uh, are a massive problem. Um, so yeah, it becomes quite, it, it can be quite difficult and, uh, you know, it can be quite difficult for you to fly in that. I, I mean, uh, it's a, it's a 2D representation of a 3D picture. Um, so quite clearly there's plenty of space below and above, et cetera, et cetera, on these things, but it's still, to me, to me, that is still quite, that's a busy radar screen. Um, so yeah, next one, please, mate. Yeah. So to, uh, some top tips. Um, this is just, this has been through and the, guys have come back to me um and stuff that we've got on um we've got something on online um bryce controlled airspace 
um crossing uh, crossing guide and some of these are on there as well so um check no tams on the website before flying uh backup plan if you need to control their space we'll try and get you through but if we can't have a backup plan uh 10 to 15 miles before entry um so we try and say about five minutes flying time that just gives us enough time to sort you out uh think about your routing before you cross uh, before you call the controller uh be prepared for a different uh, routing um the gps um if you press go to or an rst and then follow the line it can get you in trouble if that line goes through control airspace happy be, happy to be corrected if that's not no longer the case if if um technology is advanced i don't fly unfortunately so if that has changed i'm happy to be corrected um so instruction to standby is just that it's not an atc clearance um We'll, we'll try and add to that uh, remain outside controlled airspace standby just to reiterate but obviously the remain outside control airspace doesn't need to be said because if you've not got a clearance to enter control airspace um people shouldn't be entering control airspace and the amount of we have a pilot who have entered it and said what well, i was talking to bryce zone um but you've, you've not been given a clearance um there's flyontrack.co.uk for airspace guides um and we're there to help honestly um and you call us on the ground and that number will take you directly through to switchboard it will put you through to the controller and it's uh please feel free to take that number that's also the number you would call if you wanted to um if you wanted to book a pd a prize uh, we don't minimum manning on weekends so we don't take pds on weekends and there's noise abatement issues as well but monday to friday um we we will take pds um and if you've got any worries about a trip you're doing um anywhere near price control airspace again give us a call and it's the best it's the best way to to operate is to um is to give us a call and um if there's any doubt just give us a call and we'll do the best we can to help you um you know it saves your problem doing it on the ground saves your problem than doing it in the air it just makes the thing life a lot easier uh we prefer that than cluttering up busy frequency when you're airborne or when you know i understand how um you know we've watched we get air experience flights of bryce so i understand how much workload there is to fly in and having to chuck the phraseology on top of that is is daunting and is hard work um so i do have um i do have empathy for that because especially when the guys are students the minute they say student and you're like you know i remember learning the words how to be to be a controller alongside learning the procedures and that's that's what a pilot's doing more so because you're two thousand three thousand five thousand foot in the air you know fly in something that you're trying to keep straight and level and you're trying to look around to see other things so it's just very daunting so having to learn the words on top of that is is very scary um so yeah next one please mike so if busy we'll prefix our standby call we remain outside control of space and we'll st we will stick to standard routes if approaching director of busy and we'll try to present a solution rather than the problem so that's to you um you know and we will try and get you across um there, i think i think we did we did some stats for our acp and i think there was one occasion where we couldn't get an aircraft across bryce control airspace and that was because we had a um, pan and it was it was really busy um otherwise we get we get stuff across because the difference between us and bristol and luton and southampton anybody else with class d airspace is that um we're because we're military we're paid for by you guys um so any complaints to the caa or the maa or the mod it's a bit different uh there's no one to complain to really with uh, you can complain to the caa about bristol but you know become it's less you know they're they're after profits whereas we're not after profits we're after helping people so the complaints that we get if we're not then people cross control airspace are quite would quite rightly um have a bit more strength to so we don't you know we try and get you across as much as we can uh next one please mike and finally um that's a prayer for for us from you apparently <laughs> And I think next slide then is that's the lot. So there's no questions during, so I'm hopeful that we didn't rush through too much. But if there's any questions, I'm very happy to take any questions now. Um, I'm also, um, I'll probably put my email address on um, this site as well. Um, so to everybody, so that anybody can um, message me direct. Um, 
can email me as well. So, and I'm happy to take emails, but I'm also happy to take questions now. I, I just got a quick question, which is why um, d- does Bryce think, <clears throat> sorry, why do Oxford and Bryce, I guess, think they need to have more controlled airspace given that 15, 20 years ago, or well, sorry, 20, 25 years ago, you saw Oxford having the second busiest single runway in the UK, much more training going in and out of Bryce, no mode Sierra, fewer people with mode charlie like a uh, fewer people with gps as well like what's got more complicated in the last sort of 15 20 years um well the there's a lot more flying ga flying there's a lot more gliders so this airspace um i can't talk for 15 20 years ago i can only talk for some of my experiences yeah. so um I alluded to it earlier with a glider that was in that was in Bryce controlled airspace. Quite clearly, controlled airspace didn't massively help there because the glider was in controlled airspace without um, without permission. But an A330 um, inbound to Bryce uh, turned for base leg, and an aircraft a primary contact that we thought was outside controlled airspace was actually co-level. So it was about 2,600 feet. As the A330 was descending, he came he came face to face to that. Um, that was very rarely happens inside controlled airspace because we've mm-hmm. got controlled airspace. Unfortunately, it happens quite regularly outside controlled airspace because we've got no control of that aircraft. So when we bring an aircraft in from the Northwest, or we bring an aircraft in from um, Quebec 63, we're flying in Class G airspace. Those aircraft have got 200, 300 people on board. And if they're being confronted with um, aircraft all the time and they're having air proxies and they're coming quite close to them, it's quite scary for a pilot of a PA-28 or a glider to have a C-17 and an A-330 on top of it, to send on top of it quite close. But it's also quite scary for an A-330 with 200 people, 300 people on board. Um, the the amount, of the, G, uh, the amount of GA community and the, um, the amount of aircraft in the summer is massive you know as you saw from that radar capture mm. um and it's quite it can be quite unsafe there's times where it can be quite it can be really sporty and the reason why i think we need that extra protection um is to get us from airways into bryce control airspace with with no flying in class g airspace and unfortunately um it's um the biggest risk to bryce is mid-air collision unfortunately there's it's a quite a bit of a risk of mid-air collision um, in that class G airspace, because especially when stuff that we can't see their level, um, primary contacts as well don't present brilliantly to um, to radar. Um, so fr- there's frequently where a pilot will say to us, "There's a glider near me," um, but it's not simply not presenting to our radar um, because the, the the radar likes we've not got Sierra uh, uh, Bryce yet, so we've just got um, the old mode alpha so the watchman and the ssr so the watchman and um, the ssr obviously gives the numbers the watchman gives the primary contact um but they're reasonably old technology which isn't which aren't the best and sometimes simply aircraft just don't present to it um mm. so we're not seeing it so it's that protection really i i as a controller as an a330 pilot or a c17 pilot or an a400 pilot uh, they want that protection as well from getting from bryce into the airways they want to be ideally in controlled airspace to get there safely as as they would at Heathrow, as they would flying out of Bristol, as they would flying out of everywhere else. You, there's not many places where you fly um, commercial airliners through Class G airspace. Yeah. It's quite scary. It's, it's, it can be quite scary. So, you know, and there's, we, we have um, obviously the, the ASIM system, the day source system, there's frequently day source, which then become air proxies and stuff where um, when an aircraft is showing transponder tcas is is perfect because tcas works against an aircraft that has got a transponder because it basically it will not it should not uh, let them collide because they talk the electronic warning systems talk to each other but when an aircraft hasn't got a transponder and that's simply there's there's no protection there so So that's more of a glider problem than it is powered aircraft generally is it it's a non-transponder problem i think so it's a non-transponder problem. So like some of the solutions that were presented, because um, our solution at Bryce was was a mix of um, Class D and then Class E airspace. And to be in Class E airspace, that, uh, to be, for an aircraft to be in Class E airspace, I had to have a transponder on Orbi talking to us. So that's the ideal solution, is if it has a transponder, there's that extra layer of protection. Um, or if it's talking to us, 
So that's what we want. We that's and this is why I'm doing things like this is because I much prefer for you to be speaking to me um, when you're close to Bryce as opposed to you know I, if if you give me a, a, a choice ten times out of ten, I would say please speak to us even if you're transiting close to us or flying through us because then I know you're there. I can talk to you. I can coordinate you with my aircraft. Whereas if and by all means, it's, it's your right to fly um, VFR wearing a 7,000 squawk flying around, you know, it's, it's, it's everybody's airspace. Um, but I would, I would quite like, you know, in an ideal world, I quite like be speaking to you, but if you've yeah. got a transponder on, there is that layer of protection and it is more of, yeah, it is a, more of a non-transponder equipped problem. And thankfully, um, I think there's so much, so many more pilots now are aware of that and have a transponder. So, Cool. But with Oxford, I can't really talk for Oxford, if I'm honest, because although the, I know that their airspace to the north is quite, the airspace to the south is quite protected by, by our airspace. So when they've got their zero one approaches in, they're quite protected. But for one nine approaches, that airspace to the north of them for their in, inbound ILSs into one nine is quite a quite a sporty area, really. Yeah. And, you know, and it's quite, um, it's quite busy. And again, because it's class G airspace. There's stuff crossing there quite within their rights to do so at five miles when they've got, you know, they've got all their trainer aircraft and they've got their variety of aircraft inbound to Oxford. So, yeah. Thanks for the question. Did that answer it or have yeah, you got yeah, anything it does. else? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. So if I'm going through the, because it's the Oxford area of intense aerial activity, isn't it? Yep. So if I'm going through there on the way to, let's say, Gloucester, um, how you talk about contacting you, would that be in preference to Oxford or? Um, are you staying to the south of Bry's controlled airspace, or you fly into the uh, north? To the of north. To the north of to the north of Bry's. Yeah. If you're if you're flying to the north of Bry's and to the north of Oxford, I would suggest Oxford is a really good port of call because they can they can deconflict against their traffic their traffic is a bit busier so we got a large service of Bryce, which i'm sure you're all aware of it's nine to five every day including saturdays and sundays uh, which provides a lower airspace radar service to you know basic service traffic service or a deconfliction service um and um if but if you're routing close to oxford or overhead to oxford as a large controller i would say to you to speak to oxford if you're wearing oxford squawk i know you're working somebody so i can speak to them um, and I could speak to them if I need to coordinate. Thankfully, my aircraft north of Oxford isn't such an issue for my aircraft inbound to Bryce because we sort of avoid that area. So the, we, we work predominantly to the south of Bryce, which is Flyer Quebec 63. We work southwest, which is where our Hercs come in from um, when they do their low level. And then to the northwest is where our like our tartans come from because all the refueling areas are up north. So they all come down to the south. So that area is sort of less banded country for us much more of an issue for oxford so yeah i would say yeah. oxford is an ideal place to speak to they would like to speak to you i think oxford would like a large service would like to provide a large service in that area uh, if the ca would instruct them to or would pay them to i think they would provide a large service there quite effectively i think it's something that is being looked at because it is as you said that area of intense aerial activity is is, is quite busy uh, that refers as well the area of um intense air activity is to the south as well sort of west of benson um and obviously aircraft frequently speak to us um in that area um because benson is closed on weekends so we get a lot of traffic there offering a large service so Thank you. um while while i've while i think about it actually i've got um the familiarity hopefully there's a familiarity with the um 3727 squawk which is our squawk which we which is basically a listening squawk. Um, so um, it's um, it's a squawk that if you're working in an area close to Bryce of an evening after five o'clock when our LARS is closed, when our LARS is open, obviously you could be speaking to us, but if you just want to let us know that you're in your local area, don't need a service, but however you're there, if you're on, but you're remaining clear of control airspace, 3727 squawk, we encourage people to wear. And then basically, they can listen out on Bryce radar one two four decimal two seven five, 
And then if we ever need coordination, we frequently see aircraft operate in that squawk and local area. We go through to them and ask them what altitude and then get coordination with them. It's a really positive thing that we um, we brought in a couple of years back and it's, it's really helpful, actually. What pilots in the local area found really helpful as well is that um, they use that frequency then, Bryce Lars, if they're flying locally and landing in fields or you know sort of sand up farm or and there's or in a field somewhere and they've not got a safety com frequency they'll tra um, transmit on 124.275 just saying exactly where they are which sort of puts a bit of a situation awareness piece out um to other pilots and local area so that, that's something that um that i should have mentioned in my brief really but yeah that's something that is um quite useful that we found we've had some good feedback on so yeah Thanks for the question, Steve. Did that answer? Oh, you're muted. Yep, all done. Thanks, pal. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, going into Oxford. If I'm going into Oxford on an instrument approach to runway 01, yep. do I make contact with them initially and then they coordinate with you? Yep, that can be done. So there's two ways of doing it. If you speak to us, um, we'll speak to you initially, hand you over to Oxford. Or if you speak to Oxford, they'll speak to us and organise that crossing. So there's um, a procedure in place, letter of agreement in place, where Oxford speak to us and they, they ask for approaches. Um, so probably about 18 months ago, it used to be that Oxford used to have uh, 0826 or was it 0927? But they used to do approaches to that uh, training approaches, but that got turned off. Um, so <laughs> they basically have they requested uh, approaches in, into zero one um, training approaches into runway zero one, um, which we then had to rejig the letter agreement to enable that to happen. So now, yeah, um, Oxford frequently get approaches into zero one, which we authorise and we let happen, and um, and then basically they we give a procedural clearance across our airspace, which works which works really well. Cool. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Thanks, Terence. Thanks for the question. Pete, Pete Stratton, I think, is next. Yeah, thanks. Thanks Hello, so Pete. much. So um, I'm not from the Cambridge Aero Club, but I but I know colleagues that are, and um, you know, I've managed to wang on myself an invitation to this really interesting chat. Thanks, Neil. Sorry, I was a You're few welcome. minutes late. I missed the beginning, but it's been absolutely fascinating. Ah, no problem. Thank always, you. Always um, such a pain to hear about infringements, and you know you have our sympathies because none of us, none of us believe infringing is the right thing to do. Um, but, you know, it's dreadful when that happens. Thankfully, I've got a very few. From a gliding perspective. Oh yeah, go on. Sorry. Genuine one. I've been flying around the area for about um, thirty years in aeroplanes and gliders, or more than thirty years actually. I'm getting old. Um, so if you've got a good gliding day when gliders are able to get up to you know, four and a half thousand feet above sea level, which isn't unusual in, in our part of the world around Bryce and, and that area, um, they wouldn't normally plan to route uh, through Bryce and Wharton, of course. Routes are always around controlled airspace because it's, you know, we're a bit of a, we're, we're a, bit of a problem because we go around in circles and zigzag to stay airborne. But, but say there was a line of energy across the top of the bride zone, which actually often happens, particularly in the northwest of the airflow. And so somebody routing south to north sees this line of energy that really is the, the best or the only way of getting north. They will probably intend to, to stay above the bride zone. But of course, you never know when you're going to meet sinking air. And there's always, there could be a risk that you descend into the zone. So a pilot is not, any sensible pilot is not going to take that risk. However, you know, it may be possible to get a crossing even, you know, uh, where you're just kind of going into the zone briefly with permission from Bryce Norton. So what would your advice be to a pilot who was sat sort of 10 miles south of Bryce Norton thinking, OK, I'd like to cross. I should be able to stay high, but there's a risk I could touch the zone. What's the advice for contacting the controller uh, from your perspective? So it's slightly unusual. No, no. Yeah, firstly contacting us would be uh, brilliant would be the best the best thing to do that because and you know that i would encourage that at all times um so okay. if he f if they think they're going to go into our zone one one nine decimal zero is the zone crossing frequency um that would be the ideal um scenario would be to let us know and then if they just told us that in english that this is the situation yeah. then depending on my traffic situation so are we talking we're talking gliders without transponder or with transponder 
Well, I was going to say with and without. So there's a mix out there. Yeah, the with would be perfect because I would put yeah, a squawk on him. Yeah. I would put a squawk on him. Uh, I would put a squawk on them, not him, um, but on them. Um, and with that in mind, I could identify him really easily. Yeah, of course. And if I could identify him really easily, then that would, um, I'm happy days. And then I would give a clearance depending on my traffic situation. Of course, if I can see them and I've identified them, I know they're there. So I sure. can route my traffic around them. So that's why that's a win-win situation for me because I know they're there. If that aircraft hasn't got a transponder, it becomes a bit, a bit more complicated. I can still identify them. It just becomes a bit harder because um, to identify an aircraft um, without a transponder, we normally need to give it a turn. So obviously in that situation, they're less in control of their turns. And um, and to identify an aircraft over a reporting point, they have to be 3,000 feet or below so that they're visual at that reporting point and I can identify them. However, the fact that they, if they've spoken to us, it just makes my life a lot easier so that I know where they are. I would then speak to that pilot and I would ask him for updated position reports depending on where he yep. is. Yep. That would help me out. That would help them out. And that would, most importantly, any aircraft I've got inbound would help me um, refer to them. Uh, if they're speaking to me, I would give them clearance to enter Bryce controlled airspace if required. And basically, I would try not to restrict his altitude because quite clearly they're not in control of the whole situation because they're working with as a glider works with the airflow. Um, yeah, so I would try and give them. And then what I would try and do then is have knowing their position, I would then try and work my aircraft around that if I've got aircraft. If I had aircraft that was, you know, to depart, I would try and encourage them to see if they could remain to the east of Bryce, for example, but then utilizing the airspace. But I would happily, happily give them access to my airspace, happy that they've called me and I would be able to give them permission to descend if required. Because then I could just say to them, I know they're there. I know where they are. I can say to you, clear to enterprise control of space if required. They might stay up. They might stay above. I might then say to them, report if you're entering price control of space. But the important thing there is there's communication happening between the two. Yeah, and that, that, that is the thing that works for me because I know, they're, I know they're there. I can hold my aircraft on the ground temporarily because when they're on the ground, they're safe. You know, but the fact is, if they're speaking to me, if they're not speaking to me and they enter, then it becomes a problem. However, if they haven't got a well, transponder, that's a, that's a huge problem. That's illegal. Yeah, I, I know, but yeah, um, yeah um, I mean that. Um, I'm, I'm guessing you might have seen the um, the recent. Uh, I mean, it was July it happened, and then the air prox report. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm familiar with that, and it's just you know completely unforgivable. Uh, that I, I have no idea what's happening with that. I mean, obviously the CA would be dealing with it. Yeah, but the air prox has put it as a as category C, but it was only the fact that because so so at Bryce we take it that um, obviously if an aircraft's got a transponder on them we can see it's in controlled airspace we know it's in controlled airspace but if an aircraft hasn't got a transponder we don't know they're in controlled airspace and we we deem them to be outside which is a, is because we think that people would adhere into the rules obviously in that case that glider was inadvertently inside controlled airspace and it was only the mm. fact that the pilot turned and was co level that then we realised the aircraft was in then we used our PAR um, to see that that aircraft um, was in control airspace, um, which we can't, you know, it doesn't for definite, but it's in the approach cone. So the PAR approach cone uh, indicated that that, part, that that aircraft was in control airspace because of the altitude it was showing. Um, but until then, we call that aircraft as believed to be outside control airspace. So unless we know an aircraft, but which is why the, the communication is key. And I would say it's something that is really helpful. Um, it's something that I noticed from last summer was that the communication between gliders talking to Bryce Zone is so much better. And it's they're calling us now and they're telling us where they are. Even if they're above the zone, they're still telling us they're there. They're still asking us for information. And that becomes a two-way system where we know where they are and it means that we can work around that. So it's much better. And I know I know there's been a lot of work from Bryce and the BGA have worked together for that, for the um and, and things like this are helping. Um but but I know for you know the the comms with the gliding community is so much better, um, you know certainly over last summer and it's just yeah it's, it's encouraging to hear when when it comes to positioning and position reports um, just so, so you're aware in case you didn't know that sort of ninety nine percent of gliders that fly across country fly with a GPS moving map so they know exactly where they are and for, and for colleagues. Um, yeah, wondering how the hell somebody infringes because all, all of us, whether we fly aeroplanes or gliders, 
you know, uh, have zero zero tolerance for infringements. This particular character, it looks like really poor pre-flight planning, from what I understand, which is so typical of infringement. It was. Um, he said something about the thermals. Uh, he's probably got lots of excuses, but basically he, he screwed up massively. Yeah. But thankfully, it's it's so few and far between that is yeah. that is yeah. that is happening so less now, and it's um, yeah. it's not. I mean, it's it's not gliders really. I mean, it's the aircraft, and we're getting you know we we with um Oxford's Motera, um, and we're going to have Motera soon ish. Um, where um we are able to identify aircraft, and we're able to track them on radar and stuff like that. So. But, um, you can't beat having a, a moving map. I think the CA says something like eighty percent of infringements are caused by aircraft that don't have have moving maps. I, I understand that the Cambridge uh, Flying Clubs. I, I read something about this. I think in in a magazine of, of re-equipped all our aircraft with really good um, instrument panels. They're probably all fitted with moving maps. Is that is that correct? Is that for Terry or for Mike? I guess that's uh, Terry's not uh, answering that. One. Yeah, we we have. I mean, the answer is um, three of our airplanes do have. Um, well, yes, we've got moving maps and GPS on all of our Cambridge Air Club aircraft. What we don't carry, and we quite deliberately didn't equip our aircraft with FLAM or any conspicuity devices, because we teach, particularly at the at the basic flying instruction stages, to, for people to look outside of the cockpit to see and be seen. Um, but no, we have moving maps, um, good avionics in all of our aircraft. And I encourage every GA pilot and glider pilot, of which you know I am one as well, Pete. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crucial really this day and age, especially in our part of the world. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Neil, for the uh, really, really helpful response. And, uh, you know, where I can, I will pass that message along. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for the question. Okay. We've got two questions on the, uh, the message, uh, Neil, if you want to have a quick yeah, I'm just I was just answering it on the message. Um, so my answer is uh, drones uh, are very small um, and present really poorly to radar, so very unlikely to, sh to show up. Um, we get um, the rules of drones, the rules on drones have changed now. So within um, airspace, with anywhere near Bryce, basically they have to ask permission. Um, to operate and we regularly get calls from people who are operating drones saying I'm, I'm operating a drone 200 feet 300 feet etc um, and we never see them on radar so no they don't present to, they don't present on radar um, so the radar is re really quite sensitive so a, a flock of birds a large flock of birds will show up as a primary contact um, but individual birds are too small to um, occasionally roundabouts show up um, when and it's like it's to do with atmospherics as well. So high pressure it, it is a bit better when the, when the, when it's low pressure, um, which is, you know, mainly when, when it's really low pressure and it's really muggy, there's going to be less flying anyway. Um, so it's sort of thing, you know, but when it's high pressure and, you know, it's clear air and stuff, then, then you'll, you'll get, um, you'll get all sorts showing up like, like trucks going around a roundabout will show up quite nicely. It's, it's really weird. Um, Deemed route, yeah, a deemed route um, is, so that's more, for, as a controller, it'll be a deemed route um, as, as far as, so I can do a deemed route, like the 3706 that I talked about in my presentation, which is eight miles east or eight miles west. Um, that is, it's a deemed route in effect that it keeps you out of the way. It keeps you out of the way of, of any Bryce aircraft. So no matter what Bryce are doing, um, you'll be out of the way of, of Bryce aircraft basically because you're below everything. So any climb out, you'll be below. Um, any aircraft inbound, you'll be below. Um, and it's a VFR route. So you can get permission to do that. So it just means it's a bit quicker. So if you're, if you're asking me to fly a 2000 feet via um, Fairford overhead, um, so you're going, for, say you're going Gloucester, White Waltham, then you said request to cross Bryce Control Airspace via Fairford overhead, I'm at 2,000 feet, uh, and, you know, Q&H and stuff, then I'll come back to you and say, um, not above, Squawk 3706, not above 1,800 feet, Bryce Q&H, and I'll give that to you straight away, because I can do that without asking anybody, because you're, you're out of the way of everything, so that's a deemed route. An undeemed route is, is when, you know, you cross just basically 
2,800 feet or 2,600 feet crossing. But if there's nothing happening at Bryce, I can do that with no problems um, as a controller because you know the idea of the game is you know, um, second rule of air traffic is expedition. I want to get you f- from A to B as quick as possible. And ideally, I want to use an undeemed route and just get you across. But sometimes I may have to rely on a deemed route to get it, which might be a bit little bit out your route, out, out, out your way. So basically, it's, a, it's more of a controller's thing. But if you get given a squawk of 3706 or a 3707 um, from Bryce Zone, you're normally going to be on a deemed route, uh, which means that they're not asking permission. So it just makes things a bit quicker. Does that answer that? Yes, thank you, Neil. Thank you, appreciate Thank that. you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks for the question. And Neil, can you hear me? I can hear something. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me on there. I'm not, no. I, it, anyway, um, this is Richard Thwaites. Uh, I'm a, an instructor at uh, Gloucester. Hi, um, Richard. Hi. Um, we use your zone uh, for training uh, quite quite significantly, as I'm sure you're aware. We in and out of Gloucester, and we use it for uh, for student training um, in terms of zone transits. And, yep so forth. Um, we do try and call um, on the uh, telephone before to uh, let, let you know what you're doing. So um, thanks for reinforcing that we're doing the right thing. 100%. Um, 100%. But... <laughs> yeah, you're doing, the right, you're doing the right thing. Okay. Um, the question was, I was quite surprised that uh, you guys don't have Mode Sierra um, on, on the radar. So it's, um, hopefully you will get it soon. But um, are you able to use uh, ADSB or FLAM or any of the other um, conspicuity as an overlay on your your, your radio? Because no. so many GA aircraft now are getting um, the um, uh, ADSB in and out um, as the CAA have given the yep. know, 500 pounds or whatever it was to do. Yeah, uh, simple answer, simple answer not. So um, the, the AirProx report um, the, uh, with a glider, um, You'll notice in uh, if you've read that, uh, you'll see in there that the Bryce supervisor um, checked flams on his phone um, during or just after the incident, and basically that ascertained. Um, I think that's how we found out who the glider was, and also what altitude he was also in his routing. Um, but we don't use it as a matter of course; it doesn't overlay. We can't overlay it onto our radar screens, which is disappointing. Um, and some do. Um, some I believe Benson do. Benson, as a unit, is significantly quieter than Bryce. So um, I believe what Benson do is they've got it um, on their. They've got a, a separate screen with it at the back, so they can look. Unfortunately, the time when that would be most used to us at Bryce is is a weekend, and simply I've not got the capacity. When the gliders are flying, it's a blue, normally a blue, blue day, significant amount. I've got six, seven, eight on Lars. I've got various zone transits. I've got my inbounds and outbounds. I've got flying club, flying in tower, and I've got four controllers in work. We just haven't got the capacity to be looking at a separate screen. If we could get it overlaid onto our radar screen, that would be amazing. But, and I, um, and when we're able to, I invite anybody on this uh, call um, to fly into Bryce um, within reason. Um, uh, you know, we can arrange that and we can get people visiting because we really did, we had that, we had a, probably about six or seven visits um, from f- um, various flying clubs and it was brilliant. It was really good. It was able to show them our screen, our our systems, what we got going on. And then you will see, um, you know, the, the, um, the deficiencies with our systems. It's being upgraded. It's, Shawbury have already had theirs upgraded. Uh, but I do believe that at the moment, even at Shawbury, I don't think they've got the ADSB, ADSD B, um, and the FLAMS capability just yet to have it um, overlaid on. And it's just a uh, it's probably something that will happen because there's a, a swell for making that happen. You know, because I can put on my radar screen now, I can put weather on the back. I can press an overlay and stick, stick some weather on the back, which is quite helpful when there's thunderstorms because I can tell pilots where where I can see squalls, for example, and it's quite clear where a squall is on, on the radar screen because I overlay the, the radar. I'm pretty sure there's going to be something that we do um, because it would make sense um, to do that at the moment, not, and I can't see that for the foreseeable, but um, yeah, it's definitely something that is um, under consideration. But anybody who does use that in the RAF, I, i.e. RAF Benson, um, do it because they've just put a screen on. They, they've got an internet screen. Um, we've not even got Wi-Fi in Bryce Tower. 
um we have it's very unreliable um we, we put it on for our no tams and it's it's um it's not the best but yeah but in a few okay. years thanks Neil. Good yeah, to, the Wi-Fi. Yeah, a, a long answer short is not the moment. So if we do it, it's it's on our phones, and we check it on we check on our phones. Uh, we use flight radar quite a lot f- to find out where aircraft are that we're due in that are due in, and we use flight radar because that's normally the best way of doing it. But again, that's on our phones, um, you know, which we're checking. So we, we quite clearly can't control with a phone next to us, looking at the phone, looking at the thing to, to see where gliders are it would be helpful it'd be helpful to know what they're doing and what they are ideally the scenario comes where tcas and flams electronic devices talk to each other so that you know at, um an a330 with tcas or a c17 or a a400 or any aircraft with tcas um talks to the flams talks to the electronic system so they avoid each other using safety measures um and that, you know that that'd be somebody's got a bit of money but technology is improving so quickly i think you know with um, you know, some of the, some of the, you know, some of the advances with technology for flying is 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 improving so quickly, um, yeah. So hopefully, watch this space, but not for the moment. Thanks. That's that's good. Thanks, Richard. Uh, you mentioned there about visits to the. To bribes, are you, uh, do you mean a flying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we've um, we've had uh, Bristol Strut, um, Campbell came across, White Waltham came across. When the guys were at Redlands, they came over. So basically, we can have about three or four. I'd like to keep it about three or four aircraft, maybe about six to eight people. And what we do, we get them in, um, we fly them in, landing fees are waived, um, and um, yeah, they fly in in the morning. Um, I, I pick them up, take them around, air tra- um, show them around air traffic, show them around the airfield. We go for lunch in, in the mess, in the sergeant's mess. Um, and then they come in, have a look, have a, have a cup of tea, see our radar screen, see some of our issues. That presentation that I've just done, I, I present unless everybody's had it. And then we just spend a bit more time. We sit upstairs, we chuck a headset on you. So you listen to the frequency, you listen to, you know, what, what it sounds like. Um, because that's a bit of a um, a bit of a surprise sometimes because you know I'm working sometimes two different frequencies and um, and I'm sure it's the same you, you know you guys are, uh, are listening to other boxes and stuff like that so you, you can understand but when they put the headset on and you're listening to multiples and it's hearing it from the other side is quite good but yeah we um we 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 love doing that at Bryce um it's it's quite um it's, it was, we had a pretty good vibe until the pandemic um yeah we probably had about maybe six or seven visits it was, it was really good um three or four aircraft in like i said landing fees waived it's something something different written in their book of, of the landing but yeah that's something as soon as we can as soon as we're able to do that i will um promulgate that to uh, to wherever i can basically to say that we can get that we would we're probably able to do you know one a month in the summer months obviously it's a bit more reliable weather wise um because we we did it was the back end of 2019 we were doing really well with them um we were getting one every couple of weeks and, and then sort of December came and there was a couple called off because of the weather. I think we did one in January 2020 and then obviously um, the, uh, March 2020, the world changed and, you know, um, and we're still, you know, we just as we thought we were just about to get, because I was going to come over and present this in person and uh, talking to Kat and Mike, we, it was all set up. I was coming over um, and that was meant to be in November um, and it was going to be in person. We were looking at that and then, they sent me off to Aberdeen to do vaccinating because the, the to boost um, and then the Omicron came and then, you know, so it's, it keeps knocking things back. But as soon as we can, as soon as we can take visits of Bryce, we're, um, we're happy to, um, to think. I've, I've put my email address on here as well um, for people to email, um, you know, to, to sort of get on a waiting list for that because um, ideally it's people from the same flying club because they all fly in together. Then they fly as a, as a loose formation. That was always quite handy. And it's quite nice that they, you know, coming in in a formation, they, people seem to like that they come in and they always designate who's the, who's the formation leader it's, it's it's pretty cool i i, I love doing it we, we land them on park them over park them over by the um by all the big planes the a330s and that you know they park on the uh, you know a prize where they've just flown over the top of they're, they're able to land and park at so I, it's quite nice i quite enjoy it and people seem to p- people seem to enjoy it and people seem to get good value out of it and it's really useful to to put you know 
to see a different side of it and to speak to people they normally only speak to via a headset. So, right. Thank you. So yeah, we look forward to that. We look forward to that as soon as we can. I've uh, got another one from David. Um, he's got his hand up. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a quick one or two things actually. Hi, David. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, I'm um, I'm the lead pilot with the wing walking team just out to the uh, west of you guys. Fantastic. Um, and we we transit your zone frequently during the summer. Um, hopefully, with, hopefully, hopefully with permission. Oh, always with permission. <laughs> Sometimes, well, no, it's very occasionally um, we get routed west of Swindon, but only when it's really busy. Um, but yeah, you mentioned the flying. Do we, obviously would we have to have um, MOD cover on the insurance? And if so, what would be the limit? I think, if I remember rightly, it was uh, indemnity insurance, and it was one million. I think. Does that sound about right? Well, um, we were invited up to Coningsby Families Day, and they wanted fifty million. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's not. It's not fifty million. It's never that much. Um, no. I mean, what I can do, um, I can either take your email address, or if you drop me an email, I've put it on the the chat, and I can check yeah. up on that because it's something that. Um, Basically, so when I get the the, the pilot in, and it's been a while. It's been, it's been a while since since I did it. Obviously, uh, it was twenty. It was twenty nineteen was the last one I organised for twenty twenty, and then we used to just send that to ops, and they basically just had to give their certificate of insurance, and they had to send me copies of that in, which I then sent to ops, which then did the um, you know, the the PPL in effect for for the booking. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so the it, I definitely indemnity insurance that the figure is is I, I can easily find out, but I yeah. I'm pretty sure it wasn't 50 million that was that's quite excessive but i would suggest that if it's if that was 50 million for coningsby flying day it's probably because that was a display it was classed yes. as a display so the, the figure was probably higher because um after the showroom incident it might have been before but with displays there's a different set of rules and it's quite you know because when you land in there if something happens and you pile into a load of people as opposed to a prize that's not going to happen you just land on an airfield where there's no people thankfully so yeah. that would likely to might explain why the figure is significantly higher because it's never anywhere near fifty million. That's I I I would remember fifty million. It was um yeah. that's, that's a high figure. Yeah, we have um, we have seven and a half million MOD cover anyway. I think um, that would I I'm, yeah that sort of comes to mind. It, it was definitely not fifty million. So that no. I'm pretty sure that would be enough because I mean we have we have flying club at Bryce and they I, I yeah. would have thought they'd I'd be shocked if they had fifty million <laughs> pound insurance, yeah. you know. So um yeah. Yeah, and the the other thing is um, when it's uh, Royal International Air Tattoo, which we sometimes um, perform at, it's usually the weekend after Farnborough. So, so we go over to Farnborough, do the show there, then we transit back as a four ship back over um, the top of uh, Wantage, um, and then we normally call Fairford up, come in via Highworth, and land. On one occasion, I think it was two thousand sixteen. We were just approaching Highworth and we came head to head with a Chinook helicopter who, as it turns out, was working Benson. We were working Fairford with a squawk and um, then he called an air props on us. So it went to board, obviously. And, uh, and it turned out that they were flying under the hood anyway. And it was the crewman that saw us in the back. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, we, we were we were four ship. I was leading. Um, and I spotted the guy as soon as he came out of the clouds in a descending right turn towards us. My number two spotted him as well. The other two didn't see him. Um, so it was it was an odd event, really. But it How close? It, uh, oh, well, he said he was within 400 metres, but I reckon it was about half a mile. Um, I would have read his registration otherwise. But uh, <laughs> it was for us, it wasn't a big deal. I didn't want to turn the formation, obviously, because there was four of us. And, um, and we were in the descent almost coming into Fairford anyway. In that scenario, on that weekend or that week, if you like, is it easier for us to speak to you guys before we get into Fairford? And would you, if I had done that, would you have seen him? Um, to, if you're speaking to Fairford, that's probably... Um, so, React Week and, and um, they're, they're literally, like, recently... The preparations for Riyadh are, are, are gathering pace, so they're hoping that that's going to happen this year, because it's Bryce controllers do that, do Riyadh. So basically, um, the Bryce controllers, radar controllers, move across to Fairford for that week, 
do all their arrivals. So basically, it'd be the same person. To be honest, if you're transiting via Fairford, it would you would have to speak to Fairford as opposed to speaking to Bryce. Um, yeah. So, like Bryce Lars becomes a bit non of a non event during during React Week because everything normally anything that's going anywhere near Fairford speaks to Fairford because, like I said, we've got about five or six of our controllers become Fairford controllers, React controllers for the week. So yeah, no, it wouldn't have made any difference. So they would have been working from the from the same radar screen, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we'd have had to send, for anything going anywhere near Fairford, and Highworth obviously is quite near Fairford, and if you're rooting up back to Rankham, you definitely would be speaking to Fairford. Um, they would be using the same screen. Potentially, Lars would be a bit less busy than Fairford, because like that week, Fairford and Manic, it, it's, yeah. all they, they, you know, sort of, Thursday, Friday, uh, you know, we're inbound days. Monday, they're outbound. I don't know what day it was. was what day was it? This happened. It was, it was the Thursday, and we were routing Farnborough Fairford. Yeah, so the the, the Thursday um, is is when they all start arriving. So it's, it's carnage. It's absolute carnage. And and it's all and and going back to my point earlier, it's all in Class G airspace as well. So which can't be helped because you know they put a re, they put um they realise that they're putting a, an air display in a in a Class G airspace. They do they do get some temporary airspace, obviously for Fairford. Yeah. But the Thursday they don't so much, and it's all being done in um it's all being done in you know in that Class G airspace just around Campbell as well. Um. So yeah, no, it wouldn't have made any difference to be honest because um. The, the fair for controllers would have the same radar screen as the price controllers. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we we're going to be in the same scenario this year um, with Farnborough, and then obviously coming across to Fairford. Yeah, it's really good news. I was um, I was really happy to hear recently that um because obviously React's not happened for a couple of years because of um because of uh, the pandemic. So it's it's really yeah. nice that the plans are in place to do that again because that's something. It's really what it's not worrying is the wrong choice of words because. Now, because it's not been done for two years, there's a bit of a gap in, in um, you know, in not capability as such, but there's a bit of a gap in the knowledge of that because it's been two years. So there's, you know, the, some of the people who worked it two years ago have now moved on. So they now we're going through all documents and stuff. Thankfully, we're getting one of our guys back from Benson, um, who was instrumental in Fairford two years ago. So actually, we're, you know, we're, we've envied the fact that that's it's there's certain things and one of the assistants one of the specialists is a guy who's been here for ages and he's really knowledgeable with all the documentation so it's, it's, it's quite useful but it is it is a busy week um especially for them um and unbelievably i've been a bryce um for about four or five reacts and i've never been to one which is really <laughs> which is really strange so i'm going to try and i'm going to try and correct that this year yeah yeah but yeah to, to, to answer your point there wouldn't have been any difference because the controller um, you would have been going to Fairford anyway, probably by high worth, you'd have been with Fairford, whatever. So you wouldn't, yeah. have, been able, you wouldn't have been able to speak to Bryce Lars for that far. Um, no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank thanks for that, David. No problem. Well, there are, I don't think there are any more questions. So um, unless there's anything else, I think Terry. Well, thank, thank you, Mike. And thank you, Neil. Well, a big thank you. A thank you to the audience for coming. And a huge thanks to you, Neil, for a brilliant presentation delivered in great style. Thank you very, very much. Very informative, very educational, very enjoyable, and really a very valuable insight into what you're doing. And it's so nice to hear about your strong support for general aviation. And we're, I'm sure, going to be all knocking on your door for practice diversions. Do it. Absolutely. And and we'll certainly be knocking on your door for, for visits. I can feel one coming up already. It's been a really good, informative lecture and a talk, very educational, as I said a moment ago. Neil, on behalf of the Cambridge Aero Club, thanks a million for doing it. I'm sorry we couldn't do it in person because of COVID, but a warm welcome awaits you at, at Cambridge. I think one or two of our controllers were, were listening in tonight. And we will all make you very welcome if you'd like to come and visit Cambridge Terry, Airport at some stage. So, Terry, I, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you very much. And thanks to all the audience and for the participation. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's been my pleasure. And let's keep talking, people. Let's keep talking to each other. I think it's um, it needs to be done. That, that is somebody calling me up who I know was on the call. And um, he's probably phoning up to say what a great uh, talk it was. Oh, thank uh, you very much. Appreciate I appreciate that. So from, from us all, Neil, thanks a million. Great to have seen you and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank good you. night. Bless. Take care, guys. Stay safe, guys.